Section 10 of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Much Ado About Nothing, Part 3. Done to Death by Slanderous Tongues. Next morning a brilliant company were assembled in the great church at Messina to see the wedding of Count Claudio and the Lady Hero. Beatrice, of course, was there with her cousin, and Leonato to give his daughter away. The young maiden, in her snowy robe and veil, stood ready, and facing her was the gallant young Count, in his bridal splendor of white and gold. "'You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady,' said the friar. "'No,' said Claudio. The bystanders were astonished at this curt response, but Leonato corrected the friar's words. "'To be married to her, friar, you come to marry her. "'Lady, you come hither to be married to this count?' "'I do,' said Hero, in a low but steady voice. "'If either of you know any inward impediment why you should not be conjoined, I charge you on your souls to utter it,' said the friar. "'Know you any hero?' demanded Claudio sternly. "'None, my lord,' came the slightly wondering but unfaltering answer. "'Know you any count?' "'I dare make his answer none,' interposed Leonato. "'Oh, what men dare do! What men may do! What men daily do, not knowing what they do!' cried Claudio in a burst of bitter scorn. Then, turning to Leonato, he said, Will you, with free soul, give me this maid your daughter? As freely, son, as God gave her to me, said Leonato. And what have I to give you that shall equal in worth this rare and precious gift, said Claudio. Nothing, unless you render her again, said Don Pedro. Sweet prince, you teach me noble thankfulness. There, Leonato, take her back again. And then Claudio, as he had sworn, in the presence of the whole congregation, brought forth his terrible accusations against Hero, and declared he would not marry her. Stung to fury by what he considered her wickedness and deceit, for the young girl's blushing modesty and grace appeared to him nothing but seeming, he related what he and the prince had seen the night before, and how Hero had spoken out of her window with a ruffian. It was useless for Hero to protest her innocence. Nothing could destroy the evidence of their own eyes. Unable to endure this cruel and astounding calumny, Hero sank fainting to the ground. Don Pedro, Claudio, and Don John left the church, the amazed wedding guests dispersed, and Leonato, Beatrice, Benedict, and the friar were left alone with the unhappy Hero. "'How doth the lady?' asked Benedict, approaching the spot where Beatrice was eagerly trying to recall her cousin to consciousness. "'Dead, I think,' cried Beatrice, in despair. "'Help, uncle! Hero! Why, hero! Uncle! Signor Benedict! Friar!' "'Death is the fairest cover for her shame that can be wished for,' said the heartbroken father. "'How now, cousin hero?' said Beatrice, as the young girl slowly opened her dazed eyes. "'Have comfort, lady,' said the friar tenderly. "'Do you look up?' said Leonato. "'Yes, wherefore should she not?' said the friar. In his terrible grief, not questioning the truth of the story, Leonato declared that death was the happiest thing that could happen to Hero after such dishonor, and that if her spirit had strength enough to survive such shame, he could almost be tempted to kill her with his own hands. "'Sir, sir, be patient,' pleaded Benedict. For my part, I am so attired in wonder, I do not know what to say. "'Upon my soul, my cousin is belied!' exclaimed Beatrice. Then the friar stepped forward, and declared his absolute belief in Hero's innocence, and his words were so clear and convincing that even Leonato began to think his daughter must be wrongfully accused. The mystery was puzzling. For, as Benedict remarked, the prince and Claudio were the soul of honor, and were only too terribly convinced themselves of the truth of what they had said. If they had been misled in any way, it must be the work of Don John, who delighted in planning deeds of villainy. 
by the good friar's advice it was agreed that for the present hero should stay secretly in retirement so that the outside world should imagine she was really dead slander would then be changed to remorse and she would be lamented excused and pitied by every one for generally it falls out that we do not prize to its full worth what we have but when it is lacked and lost then we appreciate its value so it would fare with claudio when he should hear that hero had died at his words the sweet remembrance of her lovely life would creep into his soul then he would mourn and wish he had not so accused her signor leonato let the friar advise you said benedick and though you know my loyalty and love to the prince and claudio yet by mine honour i will deal as secretly and justly in this matter as your soul would with your body so it was agreed and then the good friar and leonato took away hero to put their plan into execution left alone with benedick beatrice's rage and indignation found full vent she was justly furious at the indignity that had been put on her gentle cousin and though for a moment benedick won her to a lighter mood by confessing his love for her yet she speedily returned to the subject of which her heart was full oh that i were a man she cried her one desire being to revenge hero and punish the dastard who had wrought such an insult on her if benedick really loved her she declared he would take this office on himself and kill claudio kill claudio benedick hesitated no he could not do that claudio was his friend but he loved beatrice her generous whole-hearted sympathy for her cousin could not but prevail with one of benedick's chivalrous nature think in your soul that count claudio has wronged hero he asked solemnly yes as surely as i have a thought or a soul said beatrice with noble pride enough i am engaged i will challenge him i will kiss your hand and so i leave you by this hand claudio shall render me a dear account go comfort your cousin i must say she is dead and so farewell benedick the scoffer the jester the light-hearted wit of the prince's court showed in this moment that he was also a high-souled chivalrous gentleman fitting mate for the brave and noble-spirited beatrice in accordance with his promise benedick went to seek claudio he presently found him with don pedro the two gentlemen had just had a painful interview with leonato who had indignantly reproached them for their behavior they felt anything but happy although they persisted in thinking that they were quite justified in acting as they had done however at the sight of benedick their spirits rallied and they tried to assume their usual teasing vein of raillery but benedick was in no jesting humor with cold self-possession he delivered his challenge to claudio and then he took a dignified leave of the prince of aragon my lord for your many courtesies i thank you he said i must discontinue your company your brother don john has fled from messina you have among you killed a sweet and innocent lady for my lord lackbeard there he and i shall meet and till then peace be with him he is in earnest said the prince as benedick withdrew in most profound earnest said claudio and i'll warrant you for the love of beatrice and has challenged you most sincerely what a pretty thing man is when he goes in his doublet and hose and leaves off his wit said don pedro disdainfully but the self-satisfaction of the prince and claudio were soon to receive a severe shock the watchmen now approached bringing with them their capture of the night before the culprits baracchio and conrad and the whole miserable tale of treachery was duly unfolded leonato was sent for in haste are you the slave that with your slander slew my innocent child he asked of baracchio yes even i alone no not so villain you belie yourself said leonato here stand a pair of honorable men a third is fled that had a hand in it i thank you princes for my daughter's death it was bravely done if you bethink you of it claudio was overwhelmed with remorse he dared not ask pardon of the deeply wronged leonato but he besought him to choose his own revenge and to impose on him any penance he chose to invent don pedro also joined him in expressing his deep penitence i cannot bid you bid my daughter live replied leonato but i pray you both proclaim to all the people in messina how innocent she died hang an epitaph upon her tomb 
and sing it there to-night to-morrow morning come to my house and since you cannot be my son-in-law be my nephew my brother has a daughter almost a copy of my child that's dead marry her as you would have married her cousin and so dies my revenge claudio willingly agreed to carry out this suggestion and that night he went to the church with a solemn company and read aloud the following scroll done to death by slanderous tongues was the hero that here lies death and guerdon of her wrongs gives her fame which never dies so the life that died with shame lives in death with glorious fame hang thou there upon the tomb praising her when i am dumb he added placing the scroll on the family monument of leonato the following morning a large company again assembled in leonato's house for another wedding was to take place this time all the ladies were veiled and it was not until the words were spoken in which claudio took an unknown maiden to be his wife that the bride threw back her veil and revealed the well-loved face of hero benedick had already announced to the friar that he intended to marry the lady beatrice and leonato had given his willing approval benedick therefore approached the group of still masked figures to find his own lady and called beatrice by name what is your will she inquired taking off her mask do not you love me asked benedick why no no more than reason said beatrice provokingly why then your uncle and the prince and claudio have been deceived they swore you did beatrice laughed do not you love me she asked in her turn troth no no more than reason said benedick loftily why then my cousin margaret and ursula are much deceived for they swore you did they swore you were almost ill for me declared benedick they swore that you were well-nigh dead for me retorted beatrice tis no such matter then you do not love me no truly but in friendly recompense said beatrice with airy indifference come cousin i am sure you love the gentleman said leonato and i'll be sworn that he loves her said claudio come i will have thee said benedick but by this light i take thee for pity i would not deny you said beatrice but by this good day i yield upon great persuasion and partly to save your life for i was told you were in a consumption peace i will stop your mouth said benedick and he silenced her merry chatter with a loving kiss ha ha laughed don pedro with shy malice how dost thou benedick the married man but the lovers happiness was proof against any raillery that could be lavished on them and no lighter hearts led off the revelry that wedding day than those of beatrice and benedick end of section ten section eleven of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. A Midsummer Night's Dream, Part One. Helena and Hermia Playing the Lion. Theseus, Duke of Athens, was to wed Hippolyta, Queen of the Amazons, and the whole city was given up to merriment in honor of the occasion. Theseus had won his bride by the sword, but he was to wed her in another fashion with pomp with triumph and with revelling four days had yet to elapse before the marriage and during that time the citizens of athens were to busy themselves with preparations for the great event in the midst of the general rejoicing a gentleman of athens by name aegeus came to invoke the authority of the duke full of vexation he came to complain against his child his daughter hermia aegeus wished her to marry a certain gentleman called demetrius but meanwhile hermia had already fallen in love with another gentleman called lysander and she declared she would marry no one but lysander now the law of athens at that time gave full power to a father to dispose of his daughter as he chose that is to say if she declined to marry the man he selected the father had power to put her to death or to shut her up in a convent 
the duke of athens gave hermia four days to make her choice at the end of that time she must either consent to marry demetrius in accordance with her father's wishes or else she must retire to a convent for the rest of her days hermia answered without hesitation she would rather be shut up in a convent all her life than marry a man she did not love lysander himself pleaded that he was in every way as suitable a match as demetrius quite as well born and equally wealthy beyond all this he was beloved of hermia why then should he not try to win her besides he added demetrius had already paid court to another lady helena and had won her heart and this sweet lady was still devoted to this fickle and unworthy man i must confess i have heard of this and i intended to speak to demetrius on the subject said the duke but being so overfull of my own affairs the matter slipped out of my mind but come demetrius and come aegeus i wish to speak to both of you in private as for you fair hermia see that you prepare to obey your father's will or else the law of athens which i have no power to alter yields you up to death or to a vow of single life the duke went off with aegeus and demetrius and hermia and lysander were left alone they were very sorry for themselves and began to lament the misfortunes and the difficulties that always seem to beset the path of true love hermia was inclined to submit without further struggle but lysander was not going to give in so easily and he hurriedly unfolded a plan to save hermia from the fate that lay before her i have a widow aunt very wealthy who has no child he said her house is seven leagues distant from athens and she treats me as her own son there gentle hermia i can marry you and in that place the sharp law of athens cannot touch us if you love me then steal from your father's house to-morrow night and i will wait for you a league outside the town in that wood where i met you once with helena gathering flowers before the dawn on the first of may my good lysander cried hermia hiding her real earnestness under half jesting words i swear to you by cupid's strongest bow by his best arrow with the golden head and by all the vows that ever men broke that i will truly meet you to-morrow in the place you have appointed keep promise love look here comes helena from their earliest days helena and hermia had been the dearest of friends and the closest of companions never apart either at work or play growing up together side by side like a double cherry or two lovely berries moulded on one stem but alas love or rather jealousy had come to thrust them apart demetrius who had first paid court to helena afterwards transferred his affection to hermia and persuaded her father aegeus to favour his suit hermia cared nothing at all for demetrius and loved no one but lysander but helena could not forgive her friend for having taken her fickle lover from her and now she bitterly lamented that her own charms had been powerless to retain him i frowned upon demetrius but he loves me still said hermia for she did not wish her friend to think she had acted unfairly the more i hate the more he follows me the more i love the more he hates me said helena sadly his folly helena is no fault of mine said hermia none your only fault is your beauty would that fault were mine sighed helena take comfort he shall see my face no more said hermia lysander and i are going to fly this place we are to meet to-morrow in that wood where you and i have so often wandered and thence we shall turn our eyes from athens to seek new friends and strange companions farewell sweet playfellow pray for us and good luck grant you your demetrius helena's passion for demetrius was so strong that it overpowered all other consideration and on this occasion it made her do a very mean and disloyal action anxious to win back a little affection from her faithless lover no matter at what cost she determined to betray hermia's secret and to go and tell demetrius of her flight 
then demetrius would pursue her to-morrow night to the wood and if he rewarded helena with even a little gratitude for the information she felt her attempt would not have been in vain unknown to the lovers that same wood was chosen as a meeting-place for the following night by a very different set of people several of the petty artisans of athens anxious to celebrate the wedding in proper style had decided to perform a little play or interlude as it was called in the presence of the duke and duchess quince the carpenter was supposed to direct the proceedings of this little band of amateur actors but the ruling spirit of the company was in reality bottom the weaver bursting with self-conceit never able to keep silent a moment bottom was ready to instruct every one else in his duties and if it had only been possible for him to have played every character in the piece in addition to his own he would have been quite content as each part was mentioned and quince began to apportion them out bottom's voice was heard again and again declaring how well he could perform each one the play was to be the most lamentable comedy and the most cruel death of pyramus and thisbe and bottom was selected for pyramus the hero what is pyramus a lover or tyrant he inquired a lover that kills himself most gallantly for love answered quince that will ask some tears in the true performing of it said bottom swelling with self-importance if i do it let the audience look to their eyes the next character was thisbe the heroine and this was given to flute the bellows mender a thin lanky youth with a squeaky voice nay faith let me not play a woman i have a beard coming he said piteously that's all one you shall play it in a mask and you may speak as small as you will said quince if i hide my face let me play thisbe too cried bottom eagerly i'll speak in a monstrous little voice thisney thisney ah oh, pyramus my lover dear thy thisbe dear and lady dear no no you must play pyramus and flute you thisbe said quince well proceed said bottom quince went on with his list and presently he called out the name of snug the joiner you will play the lion's part snug he said and now i hope there is the play fitted have you the lion's part written pray you if it be give it me for i am slow of study said snug modestly for he was a very meek and mild little man you may do it extempore for it is nothing but roaring said quince let me play the lion too burst in bottom i will roar that it will do any man's heart good to hear me i will roar that i will make the duke say let him roar again if you should do it too terribly you would frighten the duchess and the ladies out of their wits so they would shriek and that were enough to hang us all said quince that would hang us every mother's son agreed the rest of the little band quaking with terror i grant you friends that if you should frighten the ladies out of their wits they would have no more discretion but to hang us said bottom but i will aggravate my voice so that i will roar as gently as any sucking dove i will roar as if it were any nightingale you can play no part but pyramus said quince firmly so bottom had reluctantly to give in and to devote his energies to deciding what coloured beard it would be best to play the important part of pyramus in it was really quite a difficult matter there were so many to choose from straw colour orange tawny purple in grain or french crown which was perfect yellow but quince said any colour would do or he might play it without a beard masters here are your parts he concluded and i am to entreat you request you and desire you to know them by to-morrow night and meet me in the palace wood a mile outside the town by moonlight there we will rehearse for if we meet in the city we shall be dogged with company and our devices known i pray you do not fail me end of section eleven section twelve of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by eva davis 
the shakespeare's storybook by mary macleod a midsummer night's dream part two the magic flower now the wood which hermia and lysander had appointed as their trysting place and where bottom and his fellow actors were also to meet to rehearse their play was the favourite haunt of fairies and on this midsummer night oberon king of the fairies was to hold his revels there sad to say for some time past there had been great dissension between oberon and his queen titania and because of their quarrels nothing went well in the surrounding country the cause of their disagreement was a lovely indian boy the sweetest little changeling imaginable queen titania had him as her attendant and jealous oberon wanted the boy for his own page titania refused to give him up he was the child of a dear friend now dead and for her sake she had reared up the boy and for her sake she would not part with him oberon and titania never met now in grove or green by the clear fountain or in the spangled starlight without quarrelling so fiercely that their elves crept for fear into acorn cups and hid themselves there they generally tried to keep out of each other's way but on this night it happened that as king oberon with his little sprite puck and his train approached from one direction queen titania and her attendant fairies came near from the other titania reproached oberon with all the ill luck that was happening because of their dissension and oberon replied that it only lay with her to amend it why should titania cross her oberon he asked i do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman set your heart at rest replied titania the whole of fairyland will not buy the child of me how long do you intend to stay in this wood asked oberon perhaps till after theseus's wedding day said titania if you will join patiently in our dance and see our moonlight revels go with us if not shun me and i will take care to avoid your haunts give me that boy and i will go with you said oberon not for your fairy kingdom was the decided answer fairies away we shall quarrel in earnest if i stay any longer as he could not win the boy by entreaty oberon resolved to try another plan to gain his desire calling his little sprite puck to him he bade him go and fetch a certain magic flower which maidens call love in idleness the juice of this flower had a wonderful charm when laid on the eyelids of a sleeping man or woman it had the power of making that person dote madly on the next living creature that was seen oberon determined to squeeze some of the juice of this flower on titania's eyes while she slept so that when she woke up she should immediately fall in love with the first creature she saw whether it were lion bear wolf or bull meddling monkey or busy ape he determined also that he would not take off the charm which he could do with another herb until she had rendered up the little indian boy as page to him fetch me this herb he said to puck and be thou here again before the leviathan can swim a league i'll put a girdle round the earth in forty minutes cried the prompt little messenger and away he flew while king oberon was awaiting puck's return he saw the unhappy lady helena approaching with her faithless lover demetrius oberon was invisible and thus he overheard what they said demetrius had come to the wood in search of hermia and lysander for helena had told him of their proposed flight oberon heard helena confess how deeply she loved demetrius and he heard demetrius spurn her roughly and declare he loved no one but hermia oberon was sorry for helena and he determined to punish demetrius he resolved to put some of the magic juice on the eyes of demetrius so that when he woke and saw helena he should fall in love with her again and then it would be helena's turn to repulse demetrius and refuse to listen to him demetrius and helena had scarcely gone on their way when puck returned hast thou the flower there welcome wanderer said oberon ay there it is said puck i pray thee give it me said oberon and his voice glided into a sweet chant i know a bank where the wild thyme blows where oxlips and the nodding violet grows quite over canopied with luscious woodbine with sweet musk roses 
and with eglantine there sleeps titania some time of the night lulled in these flowers with dances and delight and there the snake throws her enamelled skin weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in and with the juice of this i'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies oberon found titania as he had expected and stealing up quietly while she slept he squeezed some of the magic juice on her eyelids repeating this charm as he did so what thou seest when thou dost wake do it for thy true love take love and languish for his sake be it ounce or cat or bear pard or boar with bristled hair when thou wakest it is thy dear wake when some vile thing is near and laughing to himself at the strange experience which was likely to befall titania off went oberon the next wanderers to pass through that part of the wood were hermia and lysander in their flight from athens being weary they lay down to rest and speedily fell asleep king oberon had told puck to go in search of a sweet athenian lady who was in love with a disdainful youth when puck found them he was to drop some of the juice on the eyes of the man but to take care to do this when the next thing he espied would be the lady puck would know the man by his athenian garments added oberon of course by this oberon meant demetrius but puck came across lysander and hermia instead and thinking they must be the couple referred to he squeezed the magic juice on the eyelids of lysander this mistake of little puck's led to a great deal of fresh mischief soon afterwards demetrius came running along followed by helena in the darkness of the night demetrius did not notice the very people he was in search of lysander and hermia demetrius was very angry that helena would persist in following him and bidding her roughly stay where she was he hurried off alone helena indeed was too weary to pursue him further she was just bewailing his unkind treatment when she was startled to see lysander lying on the ground she did not know whether he were dead or asleep and hastily roused him what thou seest when thou dost wake do it for thy true love take now what happened the fairy charm began to take effect lysander had gone to sleep in love with hermia but opening his eyes his first glance fell on helena and in accordance with the fairy charm his affections were immediately transferred to helena he began speaking at once to helena and told her that he no longer cared for hermia helena could not understand what all this meant she thought lysander was mocking her and left him indignantly but lysander followed for he was now determined to have no one but helena lysander alack where are you poor hermia awoke in terror from a horrible dream she thought a serpent was crawling over her eating her heart and that lysander sat by smiling she shrieked to lysander to come and help her but there was no answer lysander had gone again she called lysander lord what out of hearing gone no sound no word alack where are you speak if you can hear speak i almost swoon with dread but when again no answer came to her piteous appeal hermia knew in truth that lysander was gone and she set off at once to try to find him end of section twelve section thirteen of the shakespeare storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by eva davis the shakespeare storybook by mary macleod a midsummer night's dream part three puck in mischief queen titania meanwhile was quietly sleeping and she did not even waken when quince and bottom with their ambitious little troop of actors came and began to rehearse their play close by bottom as usual took the lead 
and made himself very officious in directing all the rest but if titania did not see them some one else did puck the little imp or robin goodfellow as he was also called was always alert for any mischief sometimes he played pranks to frighten the village maidens sometimes he frolicked in the churn and prevented the butter coming so that the busy housewife toiled in vain at other times as hobgoblin or will-o'-the-wisp he led astray unwary travellers by night sometimes he took the guise of a roasted apple in a bowl of hot spiced ale and bobbed against the lips of some old gossip as she was drinking or perhaps just when some sedate elderly spinster was sitting down to tell a sad story puck would skip away with her three-legged stool and down she would go on the ground bang while all the other old cronies shook with laughter puck was much diverted with the strange crew of petty artisans from athens who had come into the wood to rehearse their play and he presently played one of his pranks on the conceited bottom the latter having spoken some of his lines stood aside for a few minutes while the others went on with their parts and unseen by any one puck seized this opportunity to pop an ass's head on bottom quite unconscious of the strange change that had taken place in his appearance bottom calmly advanced when his turn came again but at the sight of the ass's head all his companions shrieked and fled in terror calling out that they were bewitched bottom could not imagine why they behaved in this queer fashion and thought it was some trick to frighten him i will not stir from this place do what they can he said stolidly i will walk up and down here and i will sing so that they shall hear i am not afraid so he began to pace up and down singing in a very harsh discordant manner more like an ass's bray than a man's voice the ass a cock so black of hue with orange on he bill the throstle with his note so true the wren with a little quill what angel wakes me from my flowery bed cried titania starting up from slumber the charm was beginning to work and she gazed with rapture on the curious monster bottom sang on the finch the sparrow and the lark the plain song cuckoo gray whose note full many a man doth mark and there's not hints in a i pray thee gentle mortal sing again entreated titania my ear is charmed as much with your music as my eye is enthralled with your appearance thou art as wise as thou art beautiful not so neither said bottom bluntly but if i had wit to get out of this wood i have enough to serve my own turn do not desire to go out of this wood pleaded titania thou shalt remain here whether thou wish it or not i am a spirit of no common kind and i love thee therefore go with me i'll give thee fairies to attend on thee and they shall fetch thee jewels and sing while thou liest sleeping on a bank of flowers peas blossom cobweb moth and mustard seed four little elves came flying at the summons and the infatuated queen of the fairies gave this new object of her affections into their special charge they led him away to the bower of the queen and there they decked him with flowers while titania lavished caresses on the clownish monster bottom was not in the least impressed with the dainty loveliness of the queen of the fairies he accepted all her attentions with a stolid indifference and ordered the little elves about with loudish stupidity but the magic charm was so strong that titania was quite bewitched with him say sweet love what thou desirest to eat she said coaxingly truly a peck of provender was the gruff reply i can munch you your good dry oats but i pray you let none of your people stir i feel i am getting sleepy sleep thou and i will stay here beside thee said the queen fairies be gone oh how i love thee how i dote on thee hermia had gone in search of lysander but instead of finding him she came across demetrius the latter immediately began as usual to declare his affection for her 
and hermia as before repulsed him angrily lysander was the only person in the world for whom she would ever care though she could not imagine why he had deserted her so cruelly while she lay asleep this is the athenian whose eyes i told you to anoint said king oberon to puck as they watched from the thicket all that was happening this is the woman but this is not the man said puck what have you done exclaimed the king you have made a great mistake you have placed the love juice on some true love's eyes and now because of your error some true love has turned false instead of some false love turning true go swifter than the wind through the wood and look you find helena of athens she is pale and ill with sighing for love see that you bring her here by some device i will charm the eyes of demetrius before she appears puck flew off eager to repair the mischief he had done and king oberon squeezed some of the magic juice on the eyes of demetrius a few minutes later helena arrived but lysander was with her now there were fresh troubles and perplexities demetrius woke up and as the first object on which his eyes fell was helena he immediately fell in love with her again and forgot hermia but helena could not understand what all this meant she thought both men were mocking and insulting her she knew that only the day before lysander had wanted to marry hermia and that demetrius also wanted to marry hermia though he had originally paid court to herself why then did they both now pretend that it was herself that they wanted she did not know it was all the fault of that mischievous little flower hermia was as much distressed as helena it was perplexing enough when demetrius suddenly turned round and would have nothing more to say to her but what cut hermia to the heart was that her own faithful lysander should not only forsake her for helena but shower insults on her whenever she came near a pretty tangle puck had caused by his mistake demetrius and lysander became so enraged with jealousy that they challenged each other to fight but here puck interfered again to good effect he contrived so to baffle and mislead them that instead of meeting they did nothing but chase each other about in the darkness at last quite wearied out lysander sank down to rest while the faithful hermia took up her place near him then puck applied the love juice again to lysander's eyes and this time when he woke his glance fell first on hermia so at last all went well his affection was restored to her and as demetrius was already in love again with helena both sets of lovers could be happy in the meanwhile king oberon began to pity his beautiful queen for he could not bear to see her doting on such a hideous monster titania in the height of her new folly had willingly yielded up the little changeling and now that oberon had got possession of the boy he dissolved the spell without delay be as thou wast wont to be see as thou wast wont to see he chanted now my titania wake my sweet queen my oberon what visions i have had said the queen i thought i was in love with an ass there lies your love said the king pointing to where bottom still lay snoring how came these things to pass oh how i loathe his visage now exclaimed titania shrinking back in disgust oberon next bade puck remove the ass's head from bottom so that when he awoke he should think that all that had happened was nothing but a dream and then to the sound of sweet music the king and the queen of the fairies took flight once more good friends early the next morning theseus duke of athens with his promised bride hippolyta went hunting in the wood and there they came across the two pairs of lovers aegeus the father of hermia was with the duke but there was no need now to enforce the cruel law demetrius resigned all claim on hermia and declared that the only person he wished to marry was his first love helena to these happy lovers it seemed now that everything that had passed was a dream are you sure that we are awake said demetrius it seems to me that yet we sleep we dream but their happiness was no dream 
and did not melt away with morning light the wedding of lysander and hermia and of demetrius and helena took place at the same time as that of duke theseus and hippolyta great were the festivities at athens and one of the most notable features of the evening's entertainment was undoubtedly the play acted by bottom and his valiant companions a tedious brief scene of young pyramus and his love thisbe very tragical mirth ran the title in the programme and very mirthful tragedy most of the spectators found it end of section thirteen Section 14 of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary McLeod. The Merchant of Venice, Part 1. A Merry Bond. Shunned hated despised insulted the jews in the middle ages led a cruel and embittered existence among their christian brethren but beaten down and oppressed as they were in most of the countries of europe they still prospered as far as money matters were concerned and in spite of the demands continually levied on them they contrived to amass large hordes of wealth when the great nobles or merchant princes of those days got into difficulties it was to the jews they turned for help and the enormous sums charged as interest for the loan enabled the jews to fill their coffers rapidly shylock was one of the richest jews in venice although he lived in a wretched penurious style with only a clownish lad to act as servant shylock had one child a pretty flighty daughter called jessica whose nature was very different from her father's jessica was gay extravagant without much heart and with no respect or affection for her own race and kindred she longed to free herself from the miserly restraint of her father's house and to join in the amusements from which his severity debarred her not only this but she had become acquainted with a handsome young venetian called lorenzo she had secretly promised to become his wife and intended on the first opportunity to elope with lorenzo and give up the jewish religion shylock hated all christians which was scarcely to be wondered at considering the way in which he had been treated but the special object of his aversion was a certain wealthy merchant named antonio shylock hated antonio partly because whenever they happened to meet the merchant treated him with contemptuous scorn but chiefly because antonio lent out money gratis and so brought down the rate of usury in venice antonio had also at different times released poor people whom shylock had imprisoned for debt and often on the rialto which was the public place in venice where the merchants congregated antonio had railed against the grasping avarice of the jewish extortioner thus antonio had wounded shylock in the two most intense passions of his life his pride of race for in his own way shylock was a strict follower of his religion and his love of money shylock brooded over his wrongs and if ever the opportunity came when he could gratify his ancient grudge he resolved to be bitterly revenged he had long to wait but at last his chance came antonio had a friend called bassanio a gallant high-spirited gentleman but one whose open-handed generous disposition made him spend more freely than his means allowed bassanio was in love with a beautiful lady called portia and had good reason for believing that he was looked on with an eye of favour he would gladly have come forward in earnest as a suitor for her hand but his somewhat extravagant mode of living had for the moment exhausted his means and it was impossible for him to appear at belmont portia's house in the style befitting a suitor antonio who was devoted to bassanio had often helped him before and on this occasion bassanio turned to him again antonio was more than ready to help and placed all he possessed at bassanio's disposal but unfortunately at that moment he could not lay his hand on a large sum of ready money 
for all his fortune was on the high seas however he made bassanio go forth and see what his credit could do in venice and he promised to become surety to the uttermost of his means in order that bassanio might be fittingly equipped on his quest to belmont in his search for money bassanio came across shylock one of the chief usurers in venice and to him he applied for a loan shylock did not at first appear very willing to grant his request three thousand ducats well he said in a pondering deliberate fashion ay sir for three months said bassanio for three months uh, well for which as i told you antonio shall be abound antonio shall become bound well echoed shylock still in the same slow voice can you help me will you oblige me shall i know your answer said bassanio rather impatiently three thousand ducats for three months and antonio bound murmured the jew reflectively your answer to that demanded bassanio antonio is a good man mused shylock have you heard any imputation to the contrary oh no 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 my meaning in saying he is a good man is to have you understand me that he is sufficient yet his means are in supposition he hath an argosy bound to tripolis another to the indies i understand moreover on the rialto he hath a third at mexico a fourth for england and other ventures he hath squandered abroad but ships are but boards sailors but men there be land rats and water rats land thieves and water thieves i mean pirates and uh, then there is the peril of waters winds and rocks the man is notwithstanding sufficient i think i may take his bond be assured you may said bassanio i will be assured i may said shylock with a sudden snarl and that i will be assured i will bethink me may i speak with antonio here he comes said bassanio and at that moment antonio joined them the merchant repeated the request that bassanio had already made and pressed shylock for his answer could he oblige them with the loan then for a moment of ungovernable fury long-hoarded venom broke forth he reminded antonio of the pitiless contempt with which he had always treated him of the way in which he had publicly heaped insults and abuse on him it now appears you need my help continued shylock bitterly you come to me and you say shylock we would have money you say so that spurn me as you would a stranger cur over your threshold money is your suit what should i say to you should i not say hath a dog money is it possible a cur can lend three thousand ducats or shall i bend low like a slave and with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this fair sir you spat on me on wednesday last you spurned me such a day another time you called me dog and for these courtesies i'll lend you thus much money i am as like to call you so again to spit on you again to spurn you too burst out antonio if you will lend me this money do not lend it as if to a friend but rather as to your enemy from whom if he fails to pay you can with better face exact the penalty then shylock suddenly turned round and became very fawning and pretended that his only wish was to be friends with antonio and have his love he would supply his present needs he said and not take one farthing of interest the only condition he imposed was that antonio should go with him to a notary and there in merry sport sign a bond that if the money were not repaid by a certain date the forfeit should be a pound of flesh 
cut off and taken from what part of the merchant's body it pleased shylock certain in faith i'll seal such a bond and say there is much kindness in the jew said antonio you shall not seal such a bond for me cried bassanio aghast at the idea of such an agreement why do not fear man said antonio i will not forfeit it within the next two months that's a month before the forfeit becomes due i expect the return of thrice three times this bond and shylock chimed in pointing out that even if the bond did become forfeit what should he gain by exacting the penalty a pound of a man's flesh would be of no use to him not nearly so profitable as the flesh of mutton beef or goat yes shylock i will seal this bond declared antonio and it was useless for bassanio to argue further although his mind misgave him at such a sinister agreement End of section fourteen section fifteen of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson the shakespeare story book by mary mcleod the merchant of venice part two the three caskets revenge portia the lady whom bassanio hoped to win for his wife had inherited great wealth but there was one strange clause in her father's will she was not free to choose her own husband her father had ordained that there should be three caskets one of gold one of silver one of lead and portia's portrait was to be placed in one of these caskets every suitor had to make his choice and whoever was fortunate enough to select the one containing the portrait was to be rewarded with the lady's hand the report of portia's wealth and wondrous beauty spread abroad and many adventurers came in search of her portia liked none of them and felt much aggrieved to be so curbed by her dead father's will her waiting-maid nerissa tried to console her by reminding her how wise and good her father had always been holy men she said had often at their deaths good inspirations and it would very likely come to pass that the casket would never be rightly chosen except by someone who rightly loved portia listened but she was scarcely convinced among her suitors there was not one for whom she felt anything but ridicule and contempt she was therefore delighted when nerissa went on to tell her that the gentlemen were departing to their own homes and intended to trouble her no further unless she could be won by some other means than those imposed by her father i am glad the parcel of wooers are so reasonable for there is not one among them but i dote on his very absence said portia gaily heaven grant them a fair departure do you not remember lady in your father's time a venetian a scholar and a soldier that came here in company of the marquis of montferrat asked nerissa yes yes it was uh, bassanio answered portia quickly then more slowly as if she would not have nerissa notice her eagerness i think he was so called true madam he of all the men that ever my foolish eyes looked upon was the best deserving a fair lady i remember him well and i remember him worthy of your praise said portia at that moment a serving-man entered to say that four stranger lords desired to take their leave of the lady portia and that a forerunner had come from a fifth the prince of morocco who brought word that his master would be there that night come nerissa said portia with a little gesture of half comic despair while we shut the gate upon one wooer another knocks at the door the caskets were duly set out in order and the prince of morocco was to make his choice the first of gold bore this inscription who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire the second of silver carried this promise who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves the third dull lead had this blunt warning who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath 
long and carefully the prince of morocco pondered seeking to discover the hidden meaning that lay in each mysterious inscription but at last his decision was made who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire why uh, that's the lady reflected the prince all the world desires her they come from the four corners of the earth to behold fair portia one of these three caskets contains her picture is it likely that lead contains her that is too base a thought or shall i think she is immured in silver when gold is ten times more valuable give me the key i choose here there take it prince said portia and if my picture is there then i am yours the prince of morocco unlocked the golden casket and what did he behold not the fair image of the lovely portia but a grinning skull in the empty eye there was a written scroll and this is what it said all that glisters is not gold often you have heard that told many a man his life hath sold but my outside to behold gilded tombs do worms enfold you have been as wise as bold young in limbs in judgment old your answer had not been enscrolled fare you well your suit is cold cold indeed and labor lost then farewell heat and welcome frost sighed the prince and there was nothing left for him to do but to take a dignified departure the next suitor to put in appearance was the prince of aragon but he was no more fortunate than the prince of morocco his choice fell on the silver casket but for all his reward he found the portrait of a blinking idiot portia gladly saw him depart and at the same moment arrived a messenger to announce the coming of a young venetian lord some instinct made portia guess who was approaching and she was not mistaken it was indeed the lord bassanio very different were the feelings with which portia watched this suitor make his choice from those she had experienced on former occasions she had even begged bassanio to pause for a day or two for if he chose wrongly she would lose his company but bassanio replied that he must choose at once for as matters were now he lived upon the rack his chief dread was that portia might not care for him but the lady soon comforted him on that point even if he lost the prize he would have the consolation of knowing that he was really loved portia bade nerissa and the rest stand all aloof and ordered sweet music to sound while bassanio made his choice like the prince of morocco and the prince of aragon bassanio stood long in reflection before the fated caskets but unlike these princes he made a happier choice the gold and the silver he rejected for he knew how often appearances were deceitful but the humble lead which rather threatened than promised anything attracted his fancy thou meagre lead thy paleness moves me more than eloquence he said here i choose joy be the consequence bassanio unlocked the leaden casket and there he found the portrait of the lady portia with her golden hair and her eyes smiling back at him in greeting with the picture was a scroll on which was written you that choose not by the view chance is fair and choose is true since this fortune falls to you be content and seek no new if you be well pleased with this and hold your fortune for your bliss turn you where your lady is and charm her with a loving kiss a gentle scroll fair lady by your leave i come by note to give you and to receive said bassanio following the advice of the scroll he was almost dazed at his own good fortune and scarcely dared to believe it could be true until it was confirmed and ratified by the lady herself but portia left him no doubt on that point and her love and joy overflowed in generous surrender of herself and all her possessions to her new-found lord her governor her king this house these servants and myself are yours my lord she ended 
i give them with this ring which when you part from lose or give away let it foretell the ruin of your love bassanio declared he had no words in which to answer there was nothing but a wild sense of joy and as for the ring he would never part with it as long as he lived the happiness resulting from bassanio's choice of the right casket did not end with themselves for now another couple stepped forward and craved permission to be married at the same time as the lord and the lady one of bassanio's companions had come with him to belmont a gay feather-brained young fellow called graciano this lively chatterer had fixed his affections on nerissa the waiting woman and their fate too hung on the caskets for nerissa promised that if bassanio succeeded in winning her mistress she would consent to marry graciano nerissa further in imitation of portia gave her own wooer a ring and graciano like bassanio swore that he would never part with it revenge meanwhile in venice things were not going well either for shylock or for antonio the three months for which antonio had borrowed the money had almost expired when a dreadful blow fell on the jew jessica his only child fled with a christian not only this but she carried off her rich plunder of money and jewels stolen from her father's hoards shylock was almost out of his mind with rage and grief and from his frenzied ravings it was difficult to say which loss he felt the most that of his ducats or his daughter jessica in her heedless extravagance squandered money right and left and even a precious turquoise ring which her mother had given to shylock before their marriage was not held sacred jessica bartered it at genoa to a sailor in exchange for a monkey the news of his daughter's reckless prodigality cut shylock to the heart but he had one source of consolation to which he turned with savage glee antonio the merchant had met with heavy losses and one ship after another had been wrecked at sea on the rialto it was reported that antonio must certainly be bankrupt let him look to his bond cried shylock he was wont to call me usurer let him look to his bond he was wont to lend money for christian courtesy let him look to his bond why said one of antonio's friends i am sure if he forfeit you will not take his flesh what's that good for to bait fish withal said shylock with a snarl like a tiger if it will feed nothing else it will feed my revenge he has disgraced me and hindered me half a million laughed at my losses mocked at my gains scorned my nation thwarted my bargains cooled my friends heated my enemies and what's his reason i am a jew hath not a jew eyes hath not a jew hands organs senses affections passions fed with the same food hurt with the same weapons subject to the same diseases healed by the same means warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a christian is if you prick us do we not bleed if you tickle us do we not laugh if you poison us do we not die and if you wrong us shall we not revenge if we are like you in the rest we will resemble you also in that if a jew wrong a christian what is his humility revenge if a christian wrong a jew what should his sufferance be by christian example why revenge the villainy you teach me i will execute and it shall go hard but i will better the instruction and shylock's resolution was like rock nothing could shake it when the bond fell due and antonio failed to meet it shylock had him arrested and insisted on the case being brought to trial before the duke of venice no arguments could move him no appeals for mercy not even the offer of money if antonio could have got it i'll have no speaking i will have my bond was his only answer the venetian gentleman with whom jessica had fled to get married lorenzo 
was a friend of antonio and bassanio the young husband and wife in their flight happened to come across another friend of theirs who was conveying the news of antonio's disaster to bassanio and at his request lorenzo and jessica went with him to belmont they reached the house at the very moment when every one was in full tide of joy after the successful choosing of the casket portia made them welcome and salerio handed a letter to bassanio the latter turned so pale on reading it that portia guessed something terrible must have happened she claimed her right as promised wife to share in all that concerned bassanio and he told her without hesitation how matters stood is it your dear friend who is thus in trouble asked portia when she had heard the account of antonio's troubles and how it was for bassanio's sake he had run such a risk the dearest friend to me the kindest man answered bassanio the most unwearied in doing courtesies and the most unsullied in honour what sum does he owe the jew for me three thousand ducats what no more pay him six thousand and cancel the bond double six thousand and then treble that before such a friend shall lose a hair through bassanio's fault exclaimed portia first go with me to church and call me wife then hasten to venice to your friend you shall have gold to pay the debt twenty times over but let me hear the letter of your friend sweet bassanio ran the letter my ships have all miscarried my creditors grow cruel my estate is very low my bond to the jew is forfeit and since in paying it it is impossible i should live all debts are cleared between you and me if i might but see you at my death notwithstanding use your pleasure if your love do not persuade you to come let not my letter oh love dispatch all business and be gone cried portia the two marriages were hastily solemnized and then bassanio and gratiano started at once for venice when they were gone portia announced to lorenzo and jessica that during her husband's absence she intended to retire into seclusion and she committed the management of her house and estate into their hands then she gave some hurried directions to a serving man balthazar he was to carry a letter with all speed to padua to a learned cousin of portia's dr bellario look what notes and garments he gives you she said and bring them with all imaginable speed to venice to the public ferry waste no time in words but get you gone i shall be there before you come nerissa she continued i have work in hand that you do not know of we shall see our husbands before they think of us shall they see us asked nerissa they shall nerissa but in such a guise they will not know us i'll wager you anything when we are both dressed like young men i'll prove the prettier fellow of the two and wear my dagger with a braver grace but come i'll tell you my whole device when we are in my coach which waits for us at the park gates hasten for we must measure twenty miles to-day end of section fifteen section sixteen of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson the shakespeare story book by mary mcleod the merchant of venice part three a pound of flesh in the court of justice at venice a great trial was to take place shylock the jew claimed the forfeit of his bond antonio had signed the agreement that if he failed to repay the loan of three thousand ducats by a certain date the penalty was to be a pound of his own flesh cut off from whatever part of his body the jew pleased antonio had failed to repay the money and shylock insisted on the terms of the bond being carried out to the very letter terrible as this alternative was there was no evading it the duke of venice himself had to admit that if shylock chose to exact the penalty there was no law of venice that could prevent him in this extremity the duke sent for the learned doctor bellario at padua to come and help them with his counsel 
but when the court opened bellario had not yet arrived the duke entered and took his seat he looked round at the assembled people what is antonio here ready so please your grace came back the quiet answer and antonio stepped forward from the place where he stood surrounded by a little band of friends bassanio was there and graciano and many others who had come to show their sympathy with the merchant though they could not help him in his dire extremity the duke spoke a few words to antonio saying how sorry he was to find him in the power of such a terrible adversary to which antonio replied with quiet dignity that since shylock was relentless and that no lawful means could save him he was prepared to suffer patiently then shylock was called into court and the duke began the trial by making an appeal to him for mercy all the world he said thought that shylock only intended to carry his apparent malice up to the hour of execution and that then at the last moment he would show his mercy and remorse and not only forego the forfeiture but also forgive a portion of the loan because of the enormous losses which had lately fallen on antonio we all expect a gentle answer jew concluded the duke grim stony immovable shylock had listened to the duke's appeal the time for passionate frenzy was past his venomed rage had settled down into a cold calm hatred one determination possessed him and there was no power in the tongue of man to alter it he would have his bond he answered the duke quietly but with absolute decision he was offered twice the amount of his loan if every ducat in six thousand ducats were in six parts and every part a ducat i would not draw them i would have my bond was his answer to this offer the duke asked him how he could hope for mercy since he rendered none what judgment shall i dread doing no wrong was shylock's retort the pound of flesh which i demand of the merchant is dearly bought it's mine and i will have it i stand here for justice answer shall i have it as far as the decrees of venice were concerned shylock had the law on his side and the duke dared not go against them he had power however to defer the trial and he was thinking of doing this when he was told that a messenger had arrived from padua with letters from bellario the duke bade that the messenger should be called into court and nerissa entered dressed like a lawyer's clerk the letter from bellario stated that he was too ill to come himself but that he had sent in his place a very wise and learned young doctor whom he had thoroughly instructed in the case and whose wonderful skill and judgment could be thoroughly relied on the letter ended by saying that the duke must not mistrust the newcomer because of his lack of years for bellario never knew so young a body with so old a head it was well bellario had given this warning for surely no younger looking doctor of laws had ever entered the court of justice portia's locks of sunny gold were hidden away beneath a doctor's cap but nothing could conceal the youth and beauty of her face no token of hesitation or inexperience however was visible in her handling of the case she plunged in at once into the heart of the matter her first step was to appeal to shylock for the score of mercy and in words of most moving eloquence she tried to soften the jew's hard heart and to show him that higher even than the justice which he claimed was the quality of mercy but shylock stood there rigid he might have been cut in granite for any effect that portia's words had on him i crave the law the penalty and forfeit of my bond came the usual stubborn response then portia asked if antonio had not money to discharge the debt yes replied bassanio it was there ready in the court yea twice the sum if that would not suffice he would bind himself to pay it ten times over if this did not satisfy the jew it was quite evident that he was acting through sheer malice 
and bassanio besought the learned young doctor to rest the law just a little on this occasion but in order to do a great right do a little wrong it must not be replied portia nothing could alter an established decree for many an heir by the same example might creep into the state the law must be kept the bond must be fulfilled to the very letter hey daniel come to judgment cried the triumphant shylock o oh, wise young judge how i do honor thee the friends of antonio stood silent in dismay even graciano who had been loud in denunciation of the jews savage cruelty had no words now the bond was forfeit portia continued and the jew had the right to exact the penalty if he chose but her winning voice still pleaded be merciful take thrice thy money bid me tear the bond when it is paid according to the tenor was a grim reply antonio saw that all hope was over there was no use in prolonging the discussion most heartily i do beseech the court to give the judgment he said earnestly but even when acknowledging that the sentence must be carried out portia fought every inch of the way to secure some small concession for the unhappy merchant shylock had brought a knife into the court to cut the pound of flesh and scales to weigh it but he had provided no surgeon to dress the wound afterwards portia begged that he would provide one if only out of charity was it so nominated in the bond no therefore shylock declined not the smallest point would he concede the bond should be kept to the very letter ah if shylock had only known what a pitfall he was digging for himself by insisting on this point in a clear firm voice portia began to pronounce sentence a pound of the merchant's flesh was shylock's the court awarded it and the law gave it the flesh was to be cut off from his breast nearest his heart as shylock had savagely stipulated the law allowed it and the court awarded it most learned judge a sentence come prepare cried shylock and rattling his scales he darted forward knife in hand upon the merchant but portia's voice rang through the court tarry a little there is something else shylock stood still aghast antonio's friends looked up with sudden hope it was portia's turn now to keep to the letter of the law the bond gave no mention of the word blood the words expressly were a pound of flesh let shylock then take his bond his pound of flesh but if in the cutting he shed one drop of christian blood his lands and goods were by the laws of venice confiscate to the state of venice he is at the law gasped shylock and portia answered that he should see the act for himself as he had urged justice let him be assured he should have justice more than he desired oh learned judge cried gratiano mocking shylock's former words of praise mark a jew a learned judge pay the bond thrice and let the christian go said shylock here is the money said bassanio eagerly but portia held up his hand soft the jew shall have all justice soft no haste we shall have nothing but the penalty shylock was to cut off his pound of flesh but he was to shed no blood nor was he to cut more or less than just one pound if he cut more or less than a just pound if the scale turns even by the weight of a hair thou diest and all thy goods are confiscate pronounced portia give me uh, my principal and let me go said shylock i have it ready for thee here it is said bassanio again holding out the bags of gold and again portia stayed him he has refused it in the open court he shall have merely justice and his bond shall i not have barely my principal 
demanded the cowed Shylock. Thou shalt have nothing but the forfeiture, to be so taken at thy peril, Jew. Why, then, the devil give him good of it. I'll stay no further question, cried Shylock, turning to leave the court in a fury of baffled rage and spite. But he was not to get off so easily. The law had still another hold on him. He, being an alien, had offended against the laws of Venice by seeking the life of a citizen. The penalty for this, that half his goods went to the citizens, the other half to the coffers of the state, and the offender's life lay at the mercy of the duke. Stunned and crushed by this sudden calamitous turn of affairs, Shylock listened. All through the trial he had claimed nothing but justice. He had insisted that the very letter of the law should be fulfilled. The measure he had meted out to Antonio was now to be measured out for himself. But the Duke of Venice was merciful enough to pardon Shylock's life before he asked it. As for his wealth, half of it would go to Antonio, the other half to the state. But humbleness might remit the latter into a fine. Nay, take my life and all, pardon not that said Shylock, half-dazed. You take my house when you take the prop that sustains it. You take my life when you take the means whereby I live. Antonio said he would resign half the money due to him, provided Shylock would let him keep the other half in use, to render it at Shylock's death to the husband of his daughter Jessica. Further, for this favor, Shylock was to do two things. He was to give up his Jewish religion, and he was to make a will leaving all his possessions to Lorenzo and his daughter. He shall do this, said the duke, or else I will recant the pardon which I lately granted. Are thou contented, Jew? What dost thou say? asked Portia. And what was left for Shylock to answer? Baffled of his revenge, stripped of his wealth, forced to disown his faith, his very life forfeited, a hated, despised, miserable old man. He stood alone amidst the hostile throng. Not one face looked at him kindly. Not one voice was raised in his behalf. Twice he strove to speak, and twice he failed. Then, in a hoarse whisper through parched lips, came the faltering words, I am content. End of section 16. Section 17 of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson, The Shakespeare Storybook, by Mary MacLeod. The Merchant of Venice, Part Four: The Two Rings Shylock, crushed and beaten, had left the court, followed by the yells and hooting of the crowds, collected to hear the result of the trial, and Antonio and his friends hastened to express their warmest gratitude to the young doctor of laws who had so skillfully conducted the case. They begged him to accept a handsome fee, but he refused to take any money payment for his services. Bassanio insisted that he must certainly accept some remembrance, not as a fee, but as a tribute of their gratitude. Thus urged, the young doctor yielded. He looked at Antonio. Give me your gloves. I'll wear them for your sake. Then to Bassanio, and for your love, I'll take this ring from you. But Bassanio drew back. He began to make excuses. The ring was a trifle. He would not shame himself by offering it. It had been given to him by his wife, etc. The more reluctant he showed himself, the more the young doctor insisted. Finally, he went off apparently in deep offense. Then Antonio urged Bassanio to give him what he asked, because of the services he had done, and Graciano was sent after him to present the ring to him. Lorenzo and Jessica, meanwhile, had been staying at Belmont, but they were very glad to welcome back the lady of the house. 
it was a lovely moonlit night when portia and nerissa came home sweet music was sounding and all was peace and beauty their return was speedily followed by the arrival of bassanio antonio and graciano all were rejoicing but in the midst of the general gladness sounds of discord were heard graciano and his wife were having a hot dispute a quarrel already what's the matter asked portia it's about a paltry ring that nerissa gave me with a motto for all the world like cutler's poetry upon a knife love me and leave me not said graciano why do you talk of the motto or the value cried nerissa you swore to me when i gave it to you that you would wear it till the hour of death and that it should lie with you in your grave even if not for my sake yet because of your oath you ought to have held it in respect and kept it gave it to a judge's clerk no indeed the clerk that had it will never wear hair on his face yes he will if he lives to be a man i if a woman lives to be a man said nerissa scornfully now by this hand i gave it to a youth protested graciano a kind of boy a little scrubby boy no higher than yourself the judge's clerk a prating boy that they did as a fee i could not find it in my heart to deny him you were to blame graciano i must be plain with you to part so lightly with your wife's first gift said portia gravely i gave my love a ring and made him swear never to part with it she added looking tenderly at bassanio here he stands i dare be sworn he would not give it from his finger for all the wealth contained in the world now in faith graciano you have given your wife unkind cause for grief if it were me i should be mad about it how pleasant for bassiano to hear this i were best to cut my left hand off and swear i had lost the ring defending it he thought ruefully my lord bassanio gave his ring to the judge who indeed well deserved it said graciano in self-excuse and then the boy his clerk who took some pains in writing he begged mine and neither man nor master would take anything else but the two rings what ring did you give my lord asked portia not i hope the one you received from me if i could add a lie to the fault i would deny it said bassiano but you see my finger has not the ring upon it it is gone portia on hearing this pretended to get very angry and jealous and no excuses that bassanio made could appease her sweet portia he said if you knew to whom i gave the ring if you knew for whom i gave the ring and would understand for what i gave the ring and how unwillingly i left the ring when nothing would be accepted but the ring you would abate the strength of your displeasure if you had known the virtue of the ring retorted portia or half her worthiness that gave the ring or your own honour to retain the ring you would not then have parted with the ring portia thoroughly enjoyed the fun of teasing her husband and she and nerissa made the poor men quite unhappy before the secret was revealed finally antonio distressed at the discord which he imagined he had brought between husband and wife interceded for bassanio and portia allowed herself to be soothed since you will be surety for him she said to antonio give him this ring and bid him keep it better than the other by heaven it is the same i gave the doctor cried bassanio so all ended happily the mystery was explained and bassanio and graciano were duly forgiven to add to the general pleasure news reached portia that three of antonio's arguses had come safely to harbour so after all he was no longer a bankrupt but once again a rich and prosperous merchant of venice End of section seventeen Section 18 of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. As You Like It, Part 1. 
Oliver and Orlando, Rosalind and Celia. Deep in the forest of Arden lived a merry company. The duke of that country, banished by his usurping brother Frederick, had taken refuge among the green woods, and there, far from the pomp and envious clamor of court, he lived happily with a few faithful followers. Custom had made this new life sweeter than the old one of showy state. Here were no fawning courtiers, no slander and intrigue. The only hardships were those of the changing seasons. Even when the keen winds of winter made the duke shrink with cold, he would smile and say, "'This is no flattery. These are counsellors that make me feel really what I am.' and the biting blast seemed to him less cruel than the falsehood and ingratitude of men. Not far from the forest was the house that had formerly belonged to a good gentleman, Sir Roland de Bois. Dying, Sir Roland had left all his possessions to his eldest son, Oliver, excepting one thousand crowns, which was to go to the youngest son, Orlando. Sir Roland, however, had charged Oliver to bring up his two brothers carefully. Oliver had sent the second son, Jaquiz, to school, where the boy did well. But his youngest brother, Orlando, he kept at home, leaving him utterly neglected and without any sort of training. Not only did Oliver do nothing at all for his brother, but he even tried to take away what advantages Orlando possessed by nature. He made him feed with the servants, debarred him his place as brother, and in every way possible seemed to aim at unfitting him for his position as a gentleman. Orlando was indignant at such treatment, and at last he rebelled openly, declaring he would endure such servitude no longer. There was an angry dispute between the young men, in which Oliver, as usual, tried to bully his brother into submission. But Orlando's spirit was up. Stung to fury by Oliver's insults, he seized hold of him and compelled him to listen to what he had to say. A faithful old servitor of the father's interposed and tried to make peace. But Orlando was determined not to yield. "'You shall hear me,' he said as Oliver struggled to free himself. "'My father charged you in his will to give me a good education.' You have trained me like a peasant, hiding from me all gentlemanlike qualities. The spirit of my father grows strong in me, and I will no longer endure it. Therefore, allow me such exercises as becomes a gentleman, or give me the poor portion my father left me in his will, and with that I will go seek my fortune. And what will you do with it? Beg, when that is spent, sneered Oliver. Well, sir, get you in. I will not be troubled with you much longer. You shall have part of what you wish. I pray you leave me. And then, turning to the old servant Adam, he added savagely, Get you with him, you old dog. Is old dog my reward? said Adam sadly. Most true. I've lost my teeth in your service. God be with my old master. He would not have spoken such a word. But Oliver had a plan for getting rid of his younger brother, and that without expending a thousand crowns. Charles, the wrestler of the usurping duke, was to show his skill the following day at court, and Oliver knew it was Orlando's intention to try a match with this famous athlete. This report had also privately reached the ears of the wrestler. Charles was a most powerful opponent, deadly in skill and strength. Being a friend of Oliver's, and not wishing to harm the young Orlando, he came to Oliver's house to warn him and dissuade his brother from making the attempt, or at least to let him know, in the event of any injury happening to Orlando, that it would be entirely of the boy's own seeking, and altogether against Charles's will. Oliver thanked Charles for his kind thought, and said he had himself tried by every means to dissuade Orlando, but that he was resolute. "'I tell you, Charles, he is the stubbornest young fellow in France,' Oliver said maliciously. "'Fool of ambition, envious of every man's good parts. A secret and villainous contriver against me, his own brother. Therefore use your discretion.' 
I had as lief you broke his neck as his finger, and you had better be on your guard. If you do him any slight disgrace, or if he fails to win glory for himself, he will practice against you by poison, entrap you by some treacherous device, and never leave you till he has taken your life by some indirect means or other. For I assure you, and I speak it almost with tears, there is no one living at this day so young and so villainous. "'I am heartily glad I came to you,' he said. "'If he comes to-morrow, I'll give him his payment.' And away he went, vowing to punish Orlando. "'Now I'll stir up the youngster,' thought Oliver. "'I hope I shall soon see the end of him. "'For though I don't know why, I've an absolute hatred of the boy. "'Yet he is gentle, never schooled, and yet learned, full of noble device, enchantingly beloved by every one, indeed so much in the hearts of all, especially of my own people, that I am altogether thrown in the shade. But it shall not be so long. This wrestler will put it all right. Nothing remains but to make the boy more eager for the wrestling, and that I'll go and do at once. Rosalind and Celia when the rightful duke was sent into banishment, Frederick, the usurping duke, allowed his daughter Rosalind to stay on at court, to be a companion to his own young daughter, Celia. The cousins had been brought up together from their cradles, and were so devoted to each other that if Rosalind had been sent into banishment, Celia would either have followed her or died of grief at the separation. Celia strove by all the means in her power to cheer her cousin's sorrow for the loss of her father, and assured her that, when Duke Frederick died, she would never consent to be his heir, but would immediately restore to Rosalind all that he had wrongfully taken away. Rosalind's own nature was too bright and happy to waste time in useless repining, and her deep affection for her cousin made her respond very willingly to Celia's loving attempts at consolation. The girl's gay wit and merry chatter never failed, and their leisure moments found additional food for entertainment in the whimsical utterances of the court fool, or jester, Touchstone. Under his apparent nonsense often lay hidden much quaint philosophy, and Touchstone found his fool's motley a convenient cloak for leveling many a sharp-edged shaft of truth at his hearers. On the day appointed for the wrestling match, Rosalind and Celia were among the spectators. Charles had already shown his prowess by speedily overthrowing one after the other three goodly young men. Now they all lay on the ground with broken ribs, and their poor old father made such a doleful lament over his three sons that all the beholders took his part and wept in sympathy. When Orlando appeared as the next champion, there was a general feeling of dismay and compassion. What chance had this slender lad against the doughty Charles? Duke Frederick, in pity for his youth, would have fain dissuaded him but he would not be entreated. Rosalind and Celia then tried, but even they were not more successful. Orlando thanked them courteously, but refused to give up the attempt. Since their entreaties were of no avail, the only thing the ladies could do was to bestow on him their best wishes, and this they did most heartily. The result was a surprise to all. Orlando was the victor, and this time it was the redoubtable Charles who was carried senseless from the field. Duke Frederick was interested enough in the young wrestler to inquire who he was, but was far from pleased to learn he was a son of Sir Roland de Bois. Sir Roland was an honorable gentleman, but he had been no friend to the usurping duke. Rosalind's father, on the contrary, had loved Sir Roland dearly, and, by the rest of the world, he had been equally esteemed. Celia was hurt by her father's churlish remarks to Orlando, and tried to make up for them by some kind and gracious words. Rosalind, equally moved, took a chain from her neck and gave it to the young victor. "'Gentlemen, 
wear this for me one out of suit with fortune who could give more but that her hand lacks means orlando would fain have expressed his thanks but some strange feeling held him speechless he had overcome the mighty charles but he could not master this stronger champion he was still musing over what had passed when one of the lords in waiting le beau came to him and counseled him in friendship to leave the place at once duke frederick had taken a prejudice against him and was likely to resent everything he did i thank you said orlando pray tell me one thing which of those two ladies was the daughter of the duke who was here at the wrestling le beau answered that it was the smaller of the two ladies the other was the daughter of the banished duke detained by her usurping uncle to keep his own daughter company but i can tell you continued le beau that lately this duke frederick has taken a violent displeasure against his gentle niece for no other reason than that the people love her for her virtues and pity her for her good father's sake i am quite sure his malice against the lady will suddenly break forth then le beau took a courteous farewell and orlando went his way lost in a dream and murmuring heavenly rosalind for her part rosalind had been equally attracted by the gallant young wrestler and when celia began to rally her about her pensive looks she was quite ready to admit the truth in good earnest said celia is it possible that you should suddenly take so strong a liking for sir roland's youngest son the duke my father loved his father dearly urged rosalind in self-excuse <laughs> does it therefore follow that you should love his son dearly laughed celia by this sort of reasoning i should hate him for my father hated his father dearly and yet i do not hate orlando no faith for my sake do not hate him said rosalind love him because i do the cousins were interrupted by duke frederick who entered hurriedly his eyes full of anger what le beau foretold had come to pass the duke's displeasure against rosalind had been growing for some time for he was jealous at her being so universally beloved and alarmed for the safety of his own position now in a few curt words he ordered her to leave the court saying that if in ten days time she were still found within twenty miles of it she should be put to death rosalind was amazed and indignant but all appeals were useless celia in vain tried to plead for her cousin duke frederick would listen to no reason he declared that rosalind was a traitor subtle enough to steal the affections of the people away from celia herself and that once she was gone celia would shine to far greater advantage the sentence he pronounced was irrevocable rosalind was banished pronounce that sentence then on me my liege said celia i cannot live out of her company you are a fool was the duke's contemptuous answer then to rosalind he added you needs provide yourself if you stay longer than the time you die when her father left them celia again strove to cheer her cousin she utterly refused to be parted from her insisted on sharing her griefs and declared that no matter what rosalind said she intended to go with her why whither shall we go asked rosalind to seek my uncle in the forest of arden replied celia we'll have a marshal outside this was a good suggestion and in order to avoid the danger of two high-born and beautiful maidens travelling alone it was further agreed that celia should stain her face brown and attire herself in mean apparel while rosalind who was tall of stature should for better security disguise herself as a youth armed with curtle axe and with a boar spear in her hand let what fear there will lie hidden in my woman's heart she said gaily at least we'll have a dashing and martial outside in their new guise rosalind declared she would take no worse a name than jove's own page ganymede while celia in reference to her own banished state thought that 
Aliena would be a very suitable name for herself. Cousin, said Rosalind, what if we tried to steal the clownish fool out of your father's court? Would he not be a comfort to us in our travels? Celia was delighted with the suggestion. Touchstone would go with me all over the wide world, she said. Leave me alone to manage him. Now let us go get our money and jewels together and devise the fittest time and safest way to hide from the pursuit that will be made when my flight is known. Come, we go contentedly, to liberty and not to banishment. End of section 18